Hi everyone, this is Devya, and today I have Dr. Trisha Green Helch with us. She's a professor of primary healthcare sciences at University of Oxford, and she's also a trained general physician. She's here to talk about uh, the recent findings, uh, the scientific evidence which supports the airborne transmission of COVID. Thank you so much for joining me to discuss about the airborne trans uh, transmission and the recent findings of your paper. I'll start with my first question, which is if you can elaborate a little bit more about the recent findings which you have in your Lancet paper, that would be great. We looked for all the evidence both for and against the airborne spread of SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19. So we weren't just looking for evidence to support it. We were looking very hard to see if we could find any studies that had disproved it. And I suppose the first thing to say is we didn't find a single study that disproved the theory of airborne transmission, but we found many, many studies of different kinds, all of which seem to point in the direction of airborne spread. And some of those studies were, were very strong, very persuasive studies. Others were less, uh, less good studies, less persuasive, but all of them pointed in the direction that this is an airborne virus. And I think that has really important implications for our health. What has changed in terms of, you know, what we have known before about COVID-19 and how does it spread and also the um, R-naught of COVID. Okay, so there's a, there's a lot of things uh, that, that we need to talk about. The first thing is that if we go back to January 2020, uh, most people were saying that this was spread by droplets or something called fomites, which are just any object that you might have touched and put some germs on it and then someone else might pick it up. Um, and droplets tend to come out when you cough or sneeze. So for example, when someone's got a cold and they sneeze on you, the droplets so what carried the virus. Now, we have a lot of accumulated evidence now that, that many people who spread this virus have no symptoms at the time. You're, you're more contagious the day before you get symptoms than when you've actually got the cough. Uh, so people are spreading the virus without producing much in the way of droplets. Uh, you will have heard probably of, of these super spreader events in concerts where someone's singing or, or in churches. Um, and that's a very interesting way of spreading because, again, you don't produce droplets when you sing, but you do produce what we call aerosols, which are tiny, tiny particles which travel in the air. And the, the big difference between droplets and aerosols is, guess what? Droplets drop. They fall to the ground which means if you maintain your two meters physical distance, like we've been told, uh, you won't, you'll, be, you'll be quite sort of protected from droplets from someone else. I mean, unless they give a huge sneeze that goes across the room or something like that, but, but in general, the physical distancing protects you against droplet spread. But of course, if the virus is in the air, it can travel further than two meters. And that's particularly true when you're in a, in a closed space when you're in a crowded place. Um, and also actually, uh, it's all important to say that, that the airborne transmission happens uh, at close range as well as long distance. And so um, close contact with people uh, is also something you need to avoid to reduce your risk of getting this airborne virus. So, uh, you know, since uh, if it is an airborne transmission like other airborne diseases, uh, which have a higher R0, so what would you estimate? I mean, would you estimate the R0 of COVID then to be higher? Right. So, so let's clarify one thing. The, the, the R0 is um, the contagiousness, if you like, of the virus. And, and the one that people cite a lot is measles, which has got an R0 yeah. of about, I don't know, 15 uh, depending yes. on the study and depending on the circumstances, the climate, all that kind of thing. So R0 is not, is not a, a fixed uh, amount, but, but broadly speaking, measles has a high R0 and measles is also airborne. But that doesn't mean that every airborne disease has to have a high R0. So, for example, tuberculosis is also airborne. Without any doubt, there's, there's very good evidence that TB is airborne but it has a much lower R0 because it's less contagious. So let's uh, separate out this question of R0. But what we do need to focus on is 
the mode of transmission. Now, there's one very easy uh, thing that we can all do, uh, given that this is now known to be an airborne disease, and that is spend as much time out of doors as possible. And if you can't spend time out of doors, open the windows, open the doors and let that draft go through the house or the flat uh, to clear that stale air. And the reason for that, of course, is that the airborne virus hangs around in stale air, whereas it will be blown away. It'll just float up into the atmosphere uh, and you'll be much safer outside. Another thing that people can do is wear a, a well-fitting uh, mask, um, preferably an N95 mask, actually, you know, one of those, those special ones that they wear in hospitals, but, but it, it's possible to get hold of them. Um, but if you can't get hold of one of those, uh, a cloth mask that, that fits you around the sides. You know, you see these people with a mask on, but there's a gap around the side. Well, of course, yeah. if, it's, if it's in the air and the air is getting in the side, that's, that's going to be no good for you. So you do need to make sure the mask fits. Uh, sometimes people wear two masks. Um, and particularly when you're indoors. So masking when indoors, not just within that two meter distance, but whenever you're mm -hmm. indoors. Yeah, I think uh, there are a lot of uh, suggestions here. So first, let me ask you, uh, how long does the virus, uh, you know, stay suspended in the air? So that's a really good question. And it depends what kind of what kind of circumstances you're in. If you are standing next to me and we're both out, outside, the virus, if you exhale it, it will just float away within seconds. If, on the other hand, you and I are, let's say we're sitting in a taxi and the windows are closed and it's quite a small taxi and we're chatting away, actually that virus is gonna stick around in the air. Even if you get out of the taxi, um, even if you got out the taxi before I got in, that virus would probably still be in the taxi because it's not a well ventilated space and it's a very small space. So uh, another example is a school classroom. You might have 30 kids in a school classroom and maybe one of the kids is, is incubating the virus and that kid's breathing in and out. Well, how long does it stay around? And of course, it depends on the size of the classroom. It depends on the humidity, the temperature, how many windows are there, whether there's a fan blowing the air out, all that kind of thing. Um, I think a way to kind of short circuit this, a way to think, well, we can't actually just time it to say, well, let's leave it 10 minutes or 20 minutes or two hours. What we can do is use carbon dioxide monitors. Uh, and I would say that most businesses and schools, public uh, organizations should have a carbon dioxide monitor. Now, if we go outside, the level of carbon dioxide in the air is about 400 parts per million. If we go indoors and close the windows and fill the room up with people and they're all breathing, so they produce carbon dioxide, the levels of carbon dioxide will go up. And they might go up even to something like 2000 parts per million, which means the room is stuffy, the air is stale. If you open the windows and people go out, uh, you can get that uh, carbon dioxide level, the CO2 level back down to 400 parts per million. Now, as a rule of thumb, we say, if you can keep the levels in the room to below 700 parts per million, then that is gonna be a lot safer than letting those levels go up. So mm -hmm. uh, businesses get hold of carbon dioxide monitors. If it goes above 700, open the windows, let everybody out into the fresh air um, and wait till it comes down again. Of course, like we know that there are super spreader events and so on. And there was actually a limit placed on the number of people that could be in a room. Uh, so do you think like, does it really matter if you're limiting a gathering to let's say five people versus a hundred people gathering? I mean, because it's airborne, does it still have that much amount of transmission rate even with like five people indoors? Well, it's partly, it's partly statistics. You know, if I was buying a lottery ticket, if I only buy one lottery ticket, I'm less likely to win, aren't I? If I buy 20 tickets, I'm a little bit more likely to win. So it's partly that. But it is also, um, if out of those 100 people, let's say 
five of them are incubating the virus, if they're all in the same room and they're breathing in and out and, and more and more virus is accumulating, you're gonna get a higher viral load. Now, one of the interesting things about this SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, is what we call overdispersion, And that's just a fancy way of saying that some people are very, very, very uh, contagious with it. Other people who have got the virus don't pass it on to anybody. So something like 20% of um, people with the virus uh, are responsible for 80% of transmission. So it's the 80-20 rule. Now, um, that is another reason why we know that this virus is airborne, uh, because we know that some people produce a lot more aerosols. Um, now, if you go back to your wedding or your event with 100 people in, uh, and if I said, well, you know, let's say 20 of them have got the virus, one of those people will be a super spreader. Whereas if there's fewer people in the room, you've got much less chance of having a super spreading individual in that room. You talked about the ventilation of the room and of course, like that plays a big role when the virus is uh, airborne. So, uh, you know, having an air conditioner, does it also play a role in the spreading of the virus? Wow. Yeah, the air conditioner, uh, and I know we're talking about India here and I know it's pretty hot in, in parts of India. And so a lot of people do yeah. have air conditioners. The problem with that is that they tend to recirculate the same air, just cooling it. Uh, and so although it, it might feel as if the air is fresher because it's cooler and maybe there's moisture in it, it's actually getting more and more dangerous. You're much better off turning off your air conditioning and opening the windows and using okay. those lovely ceiling fans. When I was in India, you know, the, those big fans that go round and round on the top of the room, they are brilliant, especially if you can open the window as well, because the fan will, will drive the air out of the room. Uh, just as a follow-up question, since we are talking about ventilation, uh, I was always curious about the fact that I never actually heard about a lot of cases, you know, for people who were traveling in airplanes. So, uh, I mean, how would you actually, you know, talk about the airborne transmission? Yeah, absolutely. There's been very, very few cases on airplanes, and that is because the air, it, it, because airplanes are really well ventilated. They, they take the air out and they're not recycling the same air. They're filtering it. I'm not entirely sure what they're doing because I'm not an engineer. But the reason why airplanes are actually relatively safe is that there is a very sophisticated uh, uh, system for removing the air uh, and um, replacing it with much fresher air. There have been one or two um, super spreader events on, on airplanes, but considering the amount of flying that gets done, uh, remarkably few. The same is not true of trains and buses and taxis, where there's been just hundreds of examples of spreading. Uh, you know, what is the role of uh, asymptomatic transmission? Like what role does it play if the virus we uh, think like is airborne now? The point about asymptomatic transmission is that, that when we are asymptomatic, when we have no symptoms, we generally don't produce a, a lot of droplets. We, we generally, um, in speaking, in breathing, uh, we produce uh, aerosols. So the fact that so much transmission is asymptomatic suggests uh, an, an airborne, it doesn't prove it, but it just points in that direction. Um, but the other thing about asymptomatic transmission is that if you if the only people who passed it on were the ones who had symptoms, then it would be very simple. We could just say, well, you're not allowed in this building if you've got a fever or if you've got a cough. But actually, it's it's the day before you get the fever and the cough. Or maybe some people are lucky they never actually have symptoms. We think most people who develop this disease do eventually get some symptoms. Uh, but as I say, the contagiousness is higher before you get the symptoms. And that's the, that's the problem. It's a problem with households as well. I mean, we have um, a situation which I think is quite common uh, in, in all countries. But, but, but uh, you know, you've got a multi-generational household. You've got one or two people who are mainly spending time at home and maybe one or two people who are going out to work or to school. And then they go off on public transport, they mingle and interact with people in the workplace, in the school, 
in the university, wherever they're going, and then they come home and they share air with other people in the family. And particularly, we have to worry about the grandmother, grandfather, who is perhaps vulnerable, perhaps they've got diabetes, perhaps they've got a breathing problem um, with asthma or something. Um, and then, the, you know, the kids come home from school, of course, they want to hug their grandparents, all that kind of thing. And that's when it gets what we call living room transmission. Uh, and those kids are not sick, you know, they, they, they're fine until a couple of days later. And that's when the vulnerable family member becomes infected. So the way to deal with that, uh, if you've got a very vulnerable family member, it would be a good idea if they didn't spend much time and preferably didn't spend any time at the moment in the room with the family, but if they can be in their own separate living space. Uh, and also if we can get the ventilation going through the house uh, with the windows open, all that kind of thing. Uh, you know, there have been a lot of variants of COVID now, and especially, you know, the UK variant, which is uh, also in India. So uh, the airborne transmission theory, is it applicable for all the variants or does it vary from variant to variant? No, all these variants, I mean, they've got tiny differences in, in the genetic makeup of the virus, but the virus is basically the same size, the same shape. It's got the same electric charge. Uh, whatever the variant is, the, the, the differences between these variants are very minor in relation to the way it travels. So, yeah, sorry, they're all airborne. <laughs> and actually, yeah, yeah. tuberculosis is also airborne. Uh, so there's plenty of other reasons apart from COVID uh, for protecting yourself against airborne disease. So, um, you know, if I were to speak about India, there has been a sudden surge in, uh, in the cases. And it's also seen that it's affecting a lot of young people and also infants. So why do you think uh, now, you know, suddenly there is a large increase in the number of cases amongst the younger people and children, particularly? Is well, it related to the airborne transmission or is it just... Uh, you know, what, what that could be the reason? It's, it's a really, uh, it's a good question. It's an interesting question. And these um, phenomena have complex explanations. You may find it's a different explanation in different parts of the country. One issue is how, how well are we measuring this? How closely were we looking for it in the past? Because it's only a few months ago when they were saying, oh, it doesn't really affect children. And maybe that was because they weren't looking for it. Now people are a little bit more alert and they realize that kids do get infected, although they're much, much less likely to get it seriously. Um, but then there's also issues like um, how closely are those kids being exposed? So what's happening with the schools? What's, what's going on in terms of interacting with other kids? Um, and then there is the question of whether certain variants are more likely to affect children. Uh, and yeah. the trouble is that, that there are now so many different variants and different studies show different things, but there is some evidence that some of the newer variants are more uh, likely to affect children than, than the original SARS-CoV-2 virus. So in your opinion, what are the most important precautions uh, people should take, uh, especially in a populated country such as India, uh, to slow the spread and also like to, you know, completely avoid it to protect themselves and also the children. Yeah, specifically so, like, you know, if they cannot wear mask. Yeah, well, yeah, that absolutely. I mean, so, so I would look to Japan. Uh, Japan had very, very few cases, very, very few deaths. Uh, you know, this was more than a year ago because they introduced something called the three C's, which was avoid closed spaces, crowded places, and close contact. So they're the three C's. In other words, um, don't go indoors, <laughs> um, avoid crowds, uh, and stay away from people. Now, that's all very well, but when you've got to go and go to work to earn the money to feed the family, all the rest of it, sometimes we can't do that. But, but as a rule of thumb, as a principle, if we can try and spend as much time out of doors as possible. And yeah, I'm afraid we're all gonna have to 
not see our friends, not see our family as much as we used to. Uh, the whole notion of bubbles is quite an interesting one. You know, you just have a group of you that meet together, but you don't meet anybody else. We had that uh, for a while in the UK. Um, I was in a care bubble with one of my elderly relatives and then I wasn't allowed to see anybody else so that, that this relative um, stayed safe, if you know what I mean. Uh, so, so you can have that kind of thing. Um, and of course, hand washing is actually pretty important too. So I've talked to a lot about airborne transmission. I've talked about masks. I've talked about ventilation. Those are, I think, the top priorities. Um, mm -hmm. But don't stop washing hands. Don't stop cleaning surfaces because it's just basic hygiene. It will protect you against droplet infection. It'll protect you against a lot of other diseases, diarrheal disease. Many of these things are, are common in parts of India. So, so don't stop doing that. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned about the three C's, uh, which is avoiding closed spaces. So I believe like, you know, the instructions uh, by uh, given right now is like to stay indoors and not go outside because of course, like it's a populated country, right? So even if you're spending time out, uh, outside, you would have uh, interaction or you'll have a lot of people around you. Yeah. So true. just for my, just for my curiosity, I'm asking like, is it, better if you are in your own family bubble staying inside your house avoiding everybody outside and having a good ventilation or is it okay to go outside as well i mean i'm just this trying a, to yeah see. this is a great question so <laughs> you're you're much less likely to catch it out of doors but yeah i've been to mumbai i've been to delhi i know what it's like it's it's the the number of people in close contact with one another it's, it's huge somewhere. Look, don't go to those kind of places. And the reason is that if you inhale the air that someone else has just exhaled, then you could uh, catch this virus. And that is actually quite likely if you're in a kind of crush, even if you are outside. On the other hand, if you live in a small village, if you live in the country, in a town where you can walk along the street with, you know, this much distance, this much distance between you and someone else, um, and you're not puffing and panting. The other thing that you've got to worry about is joggers. If someone's, if someone's jogging and they're breathing very heavily, you want to avoid that. Uh, but otherwise, um, you're, you're still better off outside. And the other thing is, of course, it's going to drive people crazy sitting indoors, not taking any exercise. You know, it's good for our mental health to get out and take some exercise. But I'll tell you what I would say is you can spread out that exercise. You know, maybe you're an early morning person. You can get up at five o'clock in the morning to do your exercise. Or maybe you're a late night person. You don't have to go in the rush hour. Avoid the rush hour. Mm -hmm. In terms of like, even if people are going outside in terms of mask wearing, you said masks are very important and, uh, you know, the N95 mask and covering the face uh, properly and so on. So would you suggest, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people use cloth masks uh, as well. So would you suggest like double masking or single masking with a good mask? What well, is the best way? The most important thing with your mask is it's got to fit you uh, and it's got to be comfortable. And particularly when we're talking about children and masks you know in some in some countries they they require it this is, if a kid's as young, young as two um in other countries it's six in other countries it's 12 but you know a kid is not going to wear a mask unless it it's comfortable but if it is comfortable then they may be perfectly happy to keep it on all day as many kids in in um you know in china and singapore and, and places and they they wear the mask all day at school so so it's it's possible um so what kind of mask look th this really depends on the level of risk uh the most important risk is how much covid is there circulating locally in your community and unfortunately in many many parts of india at the moment this disease has just taken over it is very very prevalent and therefore, at the moment, I would say you want the highest grade protection you can possibly get. And if you can afford and can get an N95 mask, I would I would wear one of those uh, and make sure everyone in your family's got one. On the other hand, mm -hmm. 
many people don't have uh, access to N95 masks. So you can make a cloth mask. Um, denim is actually a very good material. It's a very good filter for the virus, you know, a thick cotton um, and maybe a double layer of two different fabrics is a good idea because each type of fabric has a different, what we call electrostatic properties. So two different layers of two different fabrics is, is, is better than just folding over the same fabric. Uh, but as I say, the most important thing is no, no gaps, no gaps, and it's comfortable enough to keep on so you don't end up removing it. So do you think that uh, different variants, they have a different rate of uh, infection, like, you know, how fast they infect or how fast they spread and infect people? Yes, yeah. without any doubt, there, there are new variants that are more contagious than the original SARS-CoV-2. Unfortunately, I lost my own mother to the B117 Kent variant. My mother lived in Kent, which is part of the UK where that variant uh, emerged. It was highly, Sorry. highly contagious. Um, so yeah, it's, it's uh, it, a lot of people who were exposed to that virus uh, developed uh, full-blown COVID. Uh, there's two different things here, actually. There's how contagious it is, and then there's how deadly it is, if you like. So measles is very, very contagious, but, but not that many people die of it. And there's other diseases um, that are less contagious, but more deadly. For example, uh, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, MERS, was not all that contagious, but it was very deadly. So um, the COVID is, is a bit in the middle of those. A lot of parents are, you know, especially worried about uh, kids at this point of time. So according to you, the best way to protect the children is actually to minimize the contact or exposure to more people, I believe, right? That's the only yeah, way because- Absolutely, yeah. Um, and they, they'll have to just play with their siblings and or the parents will have to play with them because you know, I've had kids, I know it's difficult, they demand to go out, they demand to go and see their friends, but this is not the time. And the other thing is that, that you know, if you've got your um, smartphone or you've, you've got some way of connecting your kid um, with their friends by, you know, remotely, it's amazing what you can do. I mean, in the UK, the kids have been having their birthday parties, they've been, they even do sleepovers. Um, virtual sleepovers where they all put their pajamas on and they they sit there and and chat to each other remotely this is what our kids are going to have to do for the next few months until this uh, very serious virus is is under control the other thing we must talk about and we haven't yet is vaccination without yes. any doubt i have been vaccinated with the oxford vaccine i've had my two jabs and i feel much safer everybody i know um, I'm encouraging them to go and have the vaccine. Uh, and, uh, you know, it is a safe vaccine. Have any, there, any type of vaccine, it doesn't matter which, where it comes from, whether it's your Johnson & Johnson or your AstraZeneca or your Pfizer, yeah. get the first one you're offered uh, and then go and have your second shot and you'll be protected. So in terms of vaccination, uh, you know, I was curious about the fact, like, how long does the protection uh, last? Well, I don't think any of us know how long the protection lasts, because this disease has only been around for just over a year. So uh, we're, we're talking indirect evidence, usually from antibody levels. Now, we know that the immunity uh, against this virus is not just through antibodies, it's also through the white blood cells, something called T cells. I think once you've had your two shots of the virus, you're going to be pr protected for at least several months and possibly for a few years. Um, we don't know yet because the research hasn't been done, the virus is too new, uh, but I think we, we, we need to not get too worried that the, the, the vaccine is going to wear off after a few months. I don't think that's the case. Although I know what you're saying, that the, the antibody teeters go down. There's no doubt about that. But that, that, you know, that's just because the immune system's, uh, you know, it's having a bit of a snooze. Um, the antibody levels uh, against any disease will go down, you know, a few months after you've been vaccinated. It doesn't mean you're not immune. Um, so thank you so much. Those were my questions. And thank you so much uh, for joining me uh, to explain about this. And I'm sure it's going to be helpful and eye-opening to a lot of people. Thank you. 
Well, this brings me to the end of this video. Thank you for watching. If you like the video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, Quick Mommy Hacks, and follow me on Instagram for some personal tips on pregnancy, childbirth, and motherhood. Also, do leave your feedback and feel free to ask questions in the comment section below.